my own list. I'm like Jethro, I guess. All right, uh, everybody get a Heavenly Highway Hymns book. Blue. Little blue book. Uh, no, is it blue? It's blue. We go colors. Okay, blue here. book. It's blue. Blue book. Number 126. At the cross. Uh, oh, I'm going to change keys already. Oh I like that one. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at, at the, the cross, cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Verse 4. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. One more time. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. A beautiful noise up unto the Lord. Amen. Good singing. We've enjoyed, last night was a great, great service all the way around. All this, uh, all this week I've been in preparation uh, for uh, last night and tonight, and the Lord has truly blessed Lee Choir Baptist Church this week. Amen. Let's give him a hand clap of praise. Amen. He's the one that deserves it. Amen. All right. Well, Gary, uh, you said that you've been singing What a Beautiful Day for the Lord to Come Again all day. So we're going to start out with another old Happy Goodman song called I Believe He's Coming Back, Just Like He Said. Who, who out there believes that? Amen. Amen. High upon a mountain from where he ascended an angel of the Lord declared that it would be. He said, don't you stand here grieving for the one that you see leaving in like manner is coming back for you and me. Oh, and I believe he's coming back like he said, I believe that a trumpet's gonna sound so loud, one day it'll wake the dead. In the twinkling of an eye, he'll split the eastern sky, and I believe he's coming back like he said. I believe the time is nearing that we'll soon see his appearing. Well, this could be 
the hour, and this could be that day when the saints from every nation were going to lose our gravitation in the middle of the air be called away. Oh, and I believe he's coming back like he said. And I believe that a trumpet's going to sound so loud one day it'll wake the dead. And in the twinkling of an eye, He's going to split that eastern sky. And I believe he's coming back like he said. Oh, and I believe he's coming back like he said. Oh, yes, and I believe that a trumpet's going to sound so loud. One day it'll wake the dead. And in the twinkling of an eye, he's going to split that eastern sky. And I believe he's coming back like he said. In the twinkling of an eye, he's going to split that eastern sky. And I believe he's coming back like he said just like he said yes she's strangled back here you ever get one of them little tickles it's right there and you're like oh no 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 i've got one of those right now but uh after service last night and uh you know, it's just a wonderful service. I like it when what comes from that pulpit is real. And I believe what we heard last night was real. And uh, it just kind of brought to mind today when I walked in the, the building and knew that it was youth night. And Royce and I have sung for the last 20 some odd years at different churches and have had lots and lots of wonderful experiences doing that. We were mere children when we started. Yeah, yeah. That's it. And uh, we were in Wilberton one Sunday morning, and God had been dealing with me for quite a while about, I, I have a six-mile trek to work, and God talks to me in that time a lot of times. You know, sometimes you just have to listen. And he was just kind of telling me how much that he loved me and how sometimes we put on the back burner by telling others how much that he loves them. He said, it's just like the little song that you learned as a child. Jesus loves me. And do you ever really think about that? Because it really isn't a child's song. It's one for each and every one of us. And it was just a reminder. And we were in this church, and there was a little girl in the front row. She was around the age of eight years old. And, and that morning, I just thought, you know what? She sat there and sang every song that we had sung that morning, and she did not know the words. But she sung anyway. So when it came to the part of the service that I felt like God wanted me to share that, I said, come on up here. And I, I handed her my microphone. I said, I'm going to let you lead this congregation in singing Jesus Loves Me. And she starts singing Jesus Loves Me and gets about halfway done. And that little girl breaks down. And it wasn't tears of being scared. It was tears of watching Jesus touch her little heart. And I looked back to the back part of the church, and about halfway back, I saw a young mother, same tears running down her face, because she was watching her child be touched by God for one of the very first times. And you know, I know last night, when those children were standing in front, there was parents in here that had tears welling up in their eyes, Amen. and hearts full of joy. For what God had done in their child's lives. And so tonight I'm just going to ask for all of you to congregationally sing with me. Jesus loves me. And remember, he loves you. It's not about a child's song. It's about a relationship with him. And realizing tonight that he truly, truly loves you. 
Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong, they are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. One more time, a hand clap of praise for Jesus. When justice called for a payment of sin, no one worthy could be found among men. But the precious Son of God, with the cross and thorny crown, He paid the debt with the blood of the Lamb paid in full by the blood of the Lamb free from sin free to live now I am and it reads on the page where all my sins they were written down paid in full the Lamb. Oh, how great was that debt that I owe, bound to pay for all those seats that I had sown. But in Jesus, my Lord, a great treasure I have found. I stand redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, paid in full by the blood of the Lamb, free from sin, free to live, now I am. And it reads on the page where my sins were written. Paid in full by the blood of the Lamb. I know it reads on that page where all my sins they were written down. Paid in full by the blood of the Lamb. Paid in full by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Well, Brother Clint said he's preaching on the cross tonight. No, there is not a better subject to preach on, in my opinion. I'm thankful for the old rugged cross. Thankful for the Lord that he was willing to go there in my place over 2,000 years ago. We're going to go back and do an old song that uh, we've been doing this for 27 years. And uh, this is one of the first songs that we ever sang as the Alversons. Now, we've sung all of our lives, but this is one after we organized as the Albersons. This is the, one of the first songs that we ever sang, and it's called Once Upon a Hill. Somebody wrote my life story Though the ink never touched the writer's quill now in heaven, I'll live happy ever after. Cause my life story started once upon a hill. Once upon a hill, 
is all it took from hidden shame my heart's been changed my life's an open book and it's never been a mystery how a fiction became real when my love story started once upon a hill i've never laid eyes upon the author Oh, but it's clear to see he's laid his hands on me. And my life story may not be the world's bestseller. Oh, but they won't have to read between the lines to see. Once upon a hill is all it took From hidden shame my heart's been changed My life's an open book And it's never been a mystery How a fiction became real When my love story started once upon a hill no it's never been a mystery how a fiction became real when my love story started once upon a hill my love story started once upon a hill. Praise his name. Well, I see a lot of kids out there, and you know what? One of my favorite things to do when I was a kid was go to Grandma's house. And I went over there on Friday evenings and went home kicking and screaming on Sunday nights. And my grandma was a little Pentecostal lady, and she didn't have television in her house. We sang out of these hymn books. Grandma's sitting in her rocking chair, rocking. And, well, at that time, I was the youngest grandchild, so I was kind of a captive audience for her. Or I was, she was my captive audience. And uh, would sing those hymns and songs all the time. We'd listen to the radio. and She loved to sing The Sun's Coming Up in the Morning, and she would say, I would love for you to uh, learn that song on the piano and play it for me, and I did. And uh, I wouldn't take anything for those memories. But one thing that uh, we would do, now, Grandma, ooh, I'm telling you, in the wintertime, she'd have blankets on that bed that high. Anybody relate to that? When you got in the bed with Grandma, you were immobilized. You couldn't turn over. You couldn't do anything. Weighted blankets before it was yes, weighted blankets. Yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, I can remember going to sleep and waking up at 3 and 4 in the morning and Grandma praying. And you thinking, oh, my goodness, Grandma, will you just go to sleep? <laughs> but, she'd be, but then secretly laying there waiting for her to call your name because she'd go through everybody in her family. And I can tell you, at probably 10 or 11 years old, kind of aggravated a little bit, but I can tell you as a 51-year-old, I'm glad I had a praying grandma. And her prayer, she's been gone since the early 80s, are still being answered all of these years later. Amen. And it's just a, it's a privilege for us because I know that we would not be singing these songs if it hadn't been for our grandma. What an influence that she had. So all you grandmas out there and grandpas, you're a blessing to those grandkids. Show them Jesus. Live before them. Amen. And we are all called to be a witness for the Lord. And this song, I love the message in it because I want to be a light for the Lord. I don't want to be a stumbling block to anyone. I want them I want everybody that I come in contact to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And this song just about says it all. Lily of the valley, 
Let your sweet aroma fill my life. Rose a share and show me how to grow in beauty in God's sight. The fairest of 10,000 make me a reflection of your light. Day stars shine down on me. Let your love shine through me in the night. Lead me, Lord, I'll follow anywhere you open up the door. Let me know your wisdom. Show me things I've never seen before. For Lord, I want to be a witness. You can take whatever's wrong and make it right. Day stars shine down on me. Let your love shine through me in the night. Oh, for Lord, I see a world that's dying, wounded by the master of deceit. Oh, they're groping in the darkness, haunted by the years of past, defeat oh but then I see you standing near me shining with compassion in your eyes and I pray Jesus shine down on me and let your love shine through me in the night I'd lead me, Lord, I'll follow anywhere you open up the door. Let me know your wisdom. Show me things I've never seen before. Lord, I want to be a witness. You can take whatever's wrong and make it right. Day stars shine down on me. Let your love shine through me in the night. Oh, yes, lead me, Lord, I'll follow. Anywhere you open up the door, let me know your wisdom. Show me things I've never seen before. For Lord, I want to be that witness. You can take whatever's wrong and make it right day stars shine down on me let your love shine through me in the night yes jesus shine down on me let your love shine through me in the night. Yes. Hallelujah. And all God's people said together. Amen. Where did the pastor go? There he is. I start saying you're moving further and further back every time. Uh, every time we get up here and look for you. There you go. There you go. <laughs> you don't think I'm on?
test and mic test. Says I'm on. I knew that all along, didn't you? Am I on now? Okay. I'm on. You'll you'll hear me. You'll hear me. Okay, there we are. Man, I'm sorry uh, for all that. Uh, man, thank you for the music. What a blessing. Amen or not, what a blessing. And I want to just chime in. Thank you for the food. Uh, my goodness, I, uh, I've come every night miserable every time I've walked up in this pulpit. It's ridiculous. It's silly. It's kind of silly. I don't know whose idea that was, but stop it. Just quit doing that. I just fill up every night and can't hardly sing, can't hardly preach. And but thank you, uh, your folks. Listen, it's been an honor to be your evangelist this week. And uh, you know, none of us knows what tomorrow holds. But I hope this isn't the last time that you and I get to be together and these kind of doings. It's just it's a, it's an honor to be here. It's good to see some people I ain't seen in a long, long time. And uh, I feel like I have some friends here. If I haven't made any friends here, let me just say to you, you're the biggest bunch of hypocrites I've ever been around in my life. Are y'all all right? But I feel like I've made some friends. Now, let me say something. It is, it's, it's youth night, or children's night, and I'm going to say this from the bottom of my heart. I, uh, I don't have any kids, and I'm not trying to be cute. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to be anything, but just honest. I, uh, as an evangelist, I don't, I don't focus on children. And here's what I mean by that. If, if a child gets saved while I'm preaching, it's because they're old enough to understand. I don't, uh, I don't go looking for it. I don't, uh, I don't try to make it happen. Uh, I, I, I just, if, if they're old enough to understand, then they're going to respond like anybody else in the world. And that's just, that's just the way we do stuff. And uh, I think most of us preachers after a while, listen, we're... We're all probably good enough that if, if, if all we wanted was a, was a raised hand or something so that we could count noses and say that we had a bunch of people saved, you know, I think all of us could probably get every, every kid in this county to do that, amen or not. So I'm just telling you that uh, I'm glad you're here as an adult. I'm glad the children are here. And uh, if they're old enough to understand, then they're going to respond the Lord for it. Bible, please. And uh, look in John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Now I'm going to be getting that, and, and, and listen, I don't know if this mic's driving you crazy, but it's kind of going in and out. And if it goes plumb out, don't worry about it and don't rest or anything like that, we'll, we'll, we'll be all right. But uh, I'm going to read from uh, verse 16. Uh, several several verses, probably too much for some of you. You know, I've gotten in trouble a lot of times for what I've said in the pulpit. I know you can't imagine that. Would y'all smile? I have gotten in trouble a lot of times by what I've said in the pulpit. Uh, but I have never, not, not one single time, have I ever gotten in trouble for reading too much Scripture. So let me read a little bit of Scripture. And then we're going to preach the message that God laid on my heart. I want you to think about the cross of our Lord Jesus. The cross of our Lord. Here's what the Bible says in John chapter 19, verse 16. It says, Then delivered he uh, them, therefore unto them, to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into the place, the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. Verse 18, where they crucified two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the middle. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Latin. Verse 21. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not king of the Jews, but rather that he said, I am the king of the Jews. 
Listen to verse 22. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. And now the coat was without seam woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it should be that the scriptures... And, and, and listen, I'm just going to say something to you parenthetically to make sense to you just a minute as I preach. But that little phrase is important. And, and, and I'm going to say it again because it shows up a couple of times. And, and, and that's this phrase, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, which said they parted the raiment among them, and for my vesture did they cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then said he to his disciples, Behold your mother, or to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from the hour that the disciple took her unto uh, his home, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, and we're almost through, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Verse 29. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. Father, be with us as we preach. Father, I pray that you would help us be attentive. I know that these people, dear Lord, are, are working people, and many of them have put in an incredible hard week already. And it's mid-time, it's mid-service, and, and they're wore out, and, and I know that. But, Father, they've come. No one forced them to be here. They chose to be here, and they're here because they love you. So, Father, I pray that as we preach, this will be a blessing uh, to them. Father, we do pray selfishly that you'd anoint us, anoint me, dear Lord Jesus, to do the task that you've set before me tonight, and that is preach your word. Father, I pray that I'll have clarity. I, I pray that my mind will be uh, focused, and I'll have remembrance of things that I've studied. And, Father, I Honestly, sincerely, that, that I would have the courage as the Spirit would even teach me while I'm preaching. Father, I'd have the, the, the courage to trust the Holy Spirit and say what the Spirit leads me to say. So, Father, we pray these things in your matchless name, in the name of Jesus, the name above every name. Amen. The death of Jesus on the cross is probably the most significant thing to all of us who, who are children of God is of, of all the things that we uh, would say that it's what brings us together, it's what we coalition around uh, for most of us, it's this one thought. It's the death of Jesus on the cross. It is the center of it all. It is the center of the gospel story. You know, the gospel story, a couple of in markings, his birth, but the death of Jesus on the cross, I hope you'd agree with me, is the utmost of all the importance of telling the story that you and I call the gospel. When Jesus died on the cross, here's, here's what I want you to understand. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for about three different reasons that affects you. He died on the cross that you might be saved from the penalty of sin. Amen or not? You understand that? He died that you might be saved from the penalty of sin. And then also at the very same time, now I don't want you to get bogged down in this, but he died at the very same time that you might be saved from the power of sin. And then because he desires for us to spend our eternity with him in heaven at the very same time, he died to save us from the very presence of sin. 
I hope this is making sense to us because what I just said to you, and I want you to grab a hold of it, listen, at the cross, when you repent, you are saved. But at the cross, when you repent, you are being saved. And at the cross, when you repent, one day you will be saved. Jesus saves you. Jesus keeps you saved. Jesus continues to save you. And it's, I don't want you to get bogged down on what I'm trying to say is, but it's a process. And it is a wonderful, glorious process. Now let me say it to you this way. That process is all on Him and not on you. How many of y'all know you didn't do anything to get into this deal? And you won't do anything to keep yourself there. It's not like you have grace in the beginning and then works in the middle. It's grace at the, at the start. It's grace at the middle. Amen. And it's grace that will present us one day to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just say some things real quickly about the cross that, that I hope you and I can rally around tonight. Are y'all still glad you came? I want you to think first off about this. I want you to think about, when you think about Jesus on the cross, I want you to believe with me when Jesus died on the cross, he died on purpose. And you say, is that important for us to remind each other? To me, it's real important. Because there's some people who actually think that the cross was kind of an afterthought. Some people think the cross was kind of plan B. You know, plan A didn't work, so therefore we're going we're gonna to try plan B. Listen, Jesus' death on the cross was not plan B. Jesus and his death on the cross was plan A. From the very foundations before the foundations of this earth was ever spoken into existence, the God who knows it all, amen or not, the God who has never learned anything. And this may surprise you, God has never had, like you and I, God's never had any of those aha moments. God's never ever said, whoa, I can't believe that. God's never said, you know, that, that kind of caught me off guard. God's never said anything like that. God knew before he even made humanity that humanity would fail him and fall into sin and reject his righteousness and our own way and choose ourselves. So God had a meeting. Meeting. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they determined before this world was ever spoken into existence that one day Jesus would come and he would walk this earth and he would live a sinless life and one day he would die on a Roman cross for your sins and my sins. Hallelujah, Jesus died on purpose. Amen or not? Not only did he die on purpose, but I'm going to tell you Jesus died willingly. Listen to me. No one had to force him to go. Now, I know some of you are here tonight under protest. I can tell by looking at you, you didn't want to be here. Your wife made you come. Your mama made you come. But when Jesus died on the cross, listen to me. He not only died on purpose, he died willingly. The scripture says, Jesus said, no one takes my life from me, but I freely lay it down. How many of you would agree with me that the Bible, from cover to cover, 66 books in the Bible, every single book is about Jesus. Every story in the Bible is about Jesus. Matter of fact, Adrian Rogers says, if you read any Old Testament story and you don't see Jesus in it, Go back and reread it because you misread it. Because every story in the Bible is about Jesus. I remember Abraham. You'll remember. He was uh, nearly a hundred years old. Sarah, not much younger. And in their old age, God gave them this big surprise. You're going to have your child. You're going to have this child that we promised you. And God gave Abraham and his wife, Sarah, a son. Now, his son was named Isaac. You guys remember? 
And, 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 and this son, when he got up to uh, a young adult age, not a little kid, when he got up to a young adult age, 19, 20 years old, God spoke to Abraham and said, Abraham, I want you to take the greatest gift you've ever had and to show your love and devotion to me, I want you to take your son and I want you to take him up on Mount Moriah and I want you to sacrifice him there to show your love and devotion for me. Can I just tell you this before you go any further? Did you know that I hate telling this story every time I tell it? I don't like this story. I don't like anything about this story. I don't even understand this story. I believe this story because I believe this story, like every story, is a type and picture and an illustration of what God the Father did for us when He gave His only begotten Son on Calvary 3 that we might have everlasting life. Amen or not? He said, take your son and to show your love and devotion for me, crucify your son. Sacrifice, I'm sorry. Sacrifice your son on Mount Moriah. To your surprise and my surprise, Isaac loved God so much. He loved his only son. Let me tell you this. He loved his only son like you and I cannot even begin to imagine how a father could love his son. But he loved God more. And he took his son and he said, Son, listen to me. We're going up to the place of sacrifice. I want you to go with me. And I want you to help me. And I'm, I'm sure Abraham had tears in his eyes. And he said, Son, listen to me. We're going to make our way up there. And we're going to trust God all the way to this place of sacrifice. Now, I want you to listen. I know I'm, I'm going way around the barn to make one little bit simple point. But how many of y'all have ever heard me preach? It's kind of what I do, amen or not. It's kind of what I do. I don't know. I don't, the short routes have always evaded me. So they're going up to Mount Moriah. Um, Abraham is probably weeping all the way. And there's young Isaac. He's, he's going along with his daddy. He has no idea what's about to happen. And about three-fourths of the way up to the mountain, I can just hear Isaac say, Hey, Pops, we're about there. I know, boy. I know. Well, Dad, listen to me. I don't mind going with you on these little journeys, but you know what? You're kind of getting to the age that you kind of need me to help you. We, we have forgot some stuff. What have we forgotten? He said, well, you did remember the wood. He said, I'm, I'm carrying that, Isaac. He said, I'm, I'm carrying the wood. And he said, Dad, I see the knife. You're, you're wearing it. But he said, Dad, you forgot the most important thing. We're almost to the top, and we ain't got a, we ain't got a sacrifice to put on the altar. And that's when Abraham looked at his son. And he said, God will provide a sacrifice. And as they made their way up to the top of the mountain, Abraham trying to figure out, God, what? What in this world have you asked me to do? And he looks at his son, and he says to the son, listen to me, I don't understand it. Boy, you've got to trust me. I myself don't understand what God is doing. But you're the sacrifice. Now I want you to listen. Because everything that Isaac is is everything that Jesus is. How many of y'all know a 20-year-old boy could have outran a 100-year-old man anytime he wanted to? And by the way, whenever his daddy says, lay on this altar, lay on this slab, this stone here. And when he laid him down and he began to raise that knife up to his son, how many of y'all know Isaac? He could have got out of that situation any time he wanted to. But he didn't. You know why he didn't? Because he lived to please his father. And the desire of his father, even when he didn't understand it, even to his own death, he was willing to do it. And by the way, you say explain that. I can't. But I'm going to tell you right now, when Jesus Christ 
stretched his arms out on Calvary's mount. And they began to lay him on that Roman cross. And they began to drive those spikes in his hands. I don't know if you know it or not, Scripture says that any time Jesus wanted to, he could have got out of that deal. He could have asked a legion of angels to come and blow everybody away and to deliver him from this death, but he chose not to because of the will and the love that he had to please his father. He told his mom and daddy when he was a little boy and he was in the temple and he was blowing the theologian's mind and they said, where have you been? And he said, mom, listen to me. I must be about my father's business. He came to die and he came to die on purpose. He came to die and he came to die willingly for me and you. And you say, why are you telling me this? Friend, listen to me. He died for you willingly. Did you know the only way you're going to go to heaven is to say yes to him? Willingly. I don't know if you know it or not, but listen, there won't be anybody in heaven under protest. Nobody will be in heaven and say, I didn't vote for this. I didn't choose this. Listen to me, you go to heaven, you're going to go to heaven because you willingly surrender your will to his will and way, amen or not. No longer your will, but his. Not only did he die willingly, he died substitutionary, sacrificially for us. Great doctrine, the doctrine of substitution. Do you know what substitution means? It means that somebody does for you what you're not able to do or accomplish for yourself. And I know uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being pretty elementary right now. I really don't have a choice. Did I, did, did I ever say to you that I graduated from Canadian high school? Are y'all all right? Canadian high school. I can remember when I was in eighth grade, I played basketball. And I want everybody to look at me. I've always been this big. When I was in eighth grade, I was this big. And I was actually one of the taller kids in eighth grade, believe it or not. I've been this big my whole life. And I can remember between my eighth grade and my freshman year going into high school, I went to the office to see my hero, Daryl James, who was the basketball coach, and I said, sign me up. He said, sign you up for what? I said, for, I'm going to play ball for you next year in high school. I said, sign me up. And he said, uh, he said, Tubby, listen. He said, I seen you play basketball. And I said, yes, sir. He said, have you ever thought about Votech? <laughs> I don't know if you know it or not, but you can't, you can't slap a boy any harder than that. I don't want to go to Votech. I'm an athlete, man. And uh, he said, well, you know what? You can do like everybody else. You can try out for the team. I only have so many suits, and you can try out. I tried out. And to my surprise and your surprise and his surprise, I made the team. Now, every once in a while in a ball game, the coach would look up at the score clock, and then he'd look down the bench where I stayed. <laughs> and he'd look up there, and, and he'd see we kind of got it going our way, and we're ahead, and then he'd look back down there, because I was a hustling dude. I just wasn't any good. But I hustled. I mean, ain't nobody practiced and hustled, wanted it any more than I did. So he kind of started for me and looked down the bench and he'd go, get in there and get you some time. So I'd get in there and I'd go take someone's place and <laughs> I'd trip over the half court line. I'd shoot the ball at the wrong goal. You ever done that? 
I'd, I'd pass the ball away. And the game would begin to turn. And coach would look back down the bench and he'd say, but you're getting there for Tubby's killing us. So somebody would go in there and they would tap me on my shoulder and they'd say, sit down. And then, you know, every once in a while somebody would get real cute and say, we're going to win, but it won't be because of you. <laughs> go sit down. Now, I don't want you to let my illustration do too much work. Every once in a while, somebody will say this. You know, I've read the last page of the book, and we win. Let me help you theologically. Let me tweak your theology just a little bit. When you read the last page of the book, it's he who wins. It's not us who wins. It's King Jesus who wins. And I'm going to tell you, 2,000 years ago, God looked down the bench, and he saw his son. And he saw me and you in the game of life and we were failures because we're sinners by birth, sinners by choice, and we're sinners by action. And God looked down the bench and he said, would you get in there for Tubby? And to your surprise and my surprise, Jesus stood up off the bench and he took off the regal robe that was his. He laid down the crown that rightly belonged to him. He clothed himself in humanity. He put on the uniform that I was wearing, amen or not. And when he clothed himself in flesh, he went down to this earth. And friend, listen to me. He did for me what I could not do for myself. And one of these days, I'm going to be presented to God and it won't be because I win. It's going to be because Jesus was my substitute. He took my place. Amen or not? He died, friend, listen to me, on purpose. He died willingly. He died sacrificially. I want you to look at this little word. I read a lot of scripture, and I'm not a good reader, and, and, and I know that. But when, when we got to the very end of this scripture I read, there's a little phrase that you love and I love, and I want us to, to just draw our attention to it in a minute. It says, when he was on the cross, he said these words. He said, it is finished. The King James text that I just read used this word, tetelestai. And that's a good word, for it is finished. Tetelestai. But there's another word, and it's, it's the word teleo. It's the same word, teleo. Tall, eczema, lima, eczema, omega. Teleo. It means it is accomplished. It is finished did you know that when Jesus said that on the cross Jesus was using one of the most common words of his day the word to tell us die or to lay was used every day in everybody's life all the time and when Jesus was on the cross and he said to tell us die it is finished listen to me Everybody that heard that, they knew what that meant. Jesus was not saying, I'm finished. He was saying something else was finished. Because in that day, if, 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 if you were an artist, by the way, I, I just almost spoke in tongues. Did you hear that? <laughs> Did, in, in Jesus' day, if somebody was an artist and they were painting, and they would take that brush and they would paint and, and they would make that magnificent piece of art. And uh, there would come a time, though, listen, there would come a time that they would look at what they have accomplished on the canvas and then they would step back and they would realize, if I make one more brush, if I make one more stroke of paint on this canvas, I'm... 
I'm going to be doing something I don't need to do. Because he'd look at it and he'd say, it's finished. Let's die. And he would lay his brush down. It is finished. And he would stand back and look at the work that he worked on the canvas. Now listen to me. That word was used by artists every day. It is finished. Did you know in that day, in Jesus' day, if you went in to pay your bill, and when you walked into the feed store to pay your bill, they would give you a receipt. And, and if you paid the bill in full, here's what they would do. They would take that little piece of parchment, and they would write this word, teleo, or to tell us die on the ticket. And that would say to you, your debt has been paid in full. Now, friend, listen to me. I, I, I hate to wear you out on something that may not be as thrilling to you as it is to me. But when, when Jesus died on the cross and he hollered out, it is finished. He was saying, listen to me, the work of redemption is done. And there's nothing else that we need to do. It is perfect. God's desire for what it took because of His own holiness and righteousness to pay your sin debt when Jesus died on the cross, there came a moment where Jesus, like an artist, said, it's over. It's done. It's finished. Sin's debt has been paid in full. Tetelestai. It is finished. Friend, that's good news, amen or not. Jesus died willingly. Jesus died on purpose. Jesus died sacrificially. How many of you would agree with me that when Jesus died on the cross, he died victoriously? Friend, I don't want you to look at the cross and say, boy, it looked like he was losing for a while. Friend, listen to me. Jesus wasn't losing when he was on the cross. It was God's plan from the very beginning. It was an act of, of victory. How many of y'all know the first time Jesus came, he came in shame? But the next time Jesus comes, he's coming in splendor. The first time he came, he came as a little lamb. But the next time he comes, he's coming as a lion. Man, the first time he came, they mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews. Hail, king of the Jews. How many of y'all know the next time he comes, there'll be no mockery? The next time he comes, somebody will shout, Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. And the Bible says at that moment every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Friend, he didn't die. Friend, he wasn't a victim of anybody's circumstance. He died on purpose, willingly, sacrificially, victoriously for me and for you. Amen or not? One night, just be patient. One night I was coming home from a roping. And that particular night at that roping, there were several cowboys that rode up to me and just needed me to just know what was going on in their life. It just seemed like that particular night, I was more of a chaplain than I was a fellow cowboy in the arena. Several guys would ride up to me and say, hey, hey, preach, pray for me. My marriage is falling apart, and boy, I'd, I'd pray for them. Or, hey, preach, pray for me. I'm, I'm struggling in this area, and I'd, and I'd pray for them. And, and that night, I just became overwhelmed by how many people in the arena recognized that I had a walk with the Lord and they wanted me to know what was going on in their lives. When I was driving home, 
I was thinking about that and I was praying and I was just talking to the Lord, thanking him for the evening, for the privilege of ministering to those at the arena. And I'm telling you right now, you, 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 you're going to think I'm trying to be spiritual. I'm, I promise I'm not. I pulled the vehicle over and I just began to kind of pray and meditate for those that asked me to pray for them. And God just told me, he said, what's in your hand? Of course, at that time, there wasn't anything in my hand. And I said, I don't understand. And God spoke to my heart again. What do you use? Why did you even have the privilege you had tonight? And I said, a rope. And God said, that's it, a rope. And I'm telling you, I couldn't write fast enough. R-O-P-E. It's so simple. But can I tell you this little simple thing that God gave me that night on the side of the road? Would you... Would you believe me if I told you that over the years I have seen hundreds of people saved? Literally, hundreds. Probably closer to a thousand. Hundreds of cowboys and cowgirls give their heart to the Lord by me simply saying to them, R, recognize your need. Now let me, let me say that to you too. R, recognize your need. Your need for Jesus tonight isn't because you smoke, drink, and chew. I hate to be the one to, to shatter your, your, your worldly way of thinking about church life and God and salvation. But your need for Jesus isn't because you smoke, drink, and chew. You have a, a deeper problem than that. I don't know if you know it or not, but the Bible says the wages of sin, no S on it. Sin singular. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died on the cross to redeem you from a sin nature. And when you get converted, you get converted from a sin nature. Sin with no S on it. And once you get saved, your life will begin to reflect that your nature has changed. Amen or not. And the sins with an S on it are supposed to look different. God changes your desires. God changes your wanter. And you begin to want to live in a way that's pleasing to him. And you do less S-I-N-S's. But you got saved from S-I-N, a sin nature that you have. And you say, really? Oh, yeah, really. I told you this already. Do you know what you got to do to go to hell? You don't have to lie, cheat, or steal to go to hell. All you got to do is be born... Live your life, say no to Jesus, and when you die, you die and go to hell. And it ain't based on what you've been doing. It's based on the one thing you haven't done. You have never repented of your sin nature to God. When you come to him in salvation, listen, please don't say to him, Lord, I'm a smoker, drinker, and chewer. Say to him, Lord, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. And I want you to save my soul a sinner. Recognize your need, R. O. By the way, we're spelling the word rope. O, open your heart. I'm not asking you to open your heart to me tonight. Friend, I don't even like me most of the time. Are y'all all right? You know, I was watching Facebook last night when I got home. Guys, just trying to see who was watching us here at Revival. I'm just confessing it to you. I was trying to see who was. Did you know the first night of Revival, uh, somebody, though, you know, there's all kinds of thumbs up and hearts and sweet little stuff, but there's one person that get, did one of those red, mean, mean faces. And I told him, I said, pretty normal. Somebody don't like me. Somebody didn't like it. And I, and I wasn't trying to be cute. It's just normal. Hey, listen to me. I'm not asking you to open your heart to me. But I'm asking you to open your heart to Jesus. How many of y'all know preachers will let you down? Preachers will fail you. I fail my congregation some way or some other probably about every day. Someone thinks I need to be here. Someone thinks I need to be there. Someone thinks I'm not doing this or, or shouldn't be doing this and spending too much time. Listen, I fail people all the time. But I'm going to tell you one thing. If you'll open your heart to Jesus, I'm going to make you this promise. Jesus never fails. As cliche as that sounds, he will never disappoint you. Churches disappoint you. 
Preachers disappoint you. Family disappoints you. Friends disappoint you. Recognize your need. You're lost. You're a sinner. Open your heart to Jesus. And then P, pray the prayer. Pray the prayer. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Aren't you glad that salvation is not about who can jump this pew to high? And who can do it the cleanest? You know, sometimes you and I as a church, we make it real hard for people to get saved. We come up with all kinds of goofy ideals. I remember one time I was in revival and God failed that night and several people got saved that night. True story. And after church though, instead of us just celebrating that they got saved, the preacher said to everyone that got saved, he said, before you go home, we'll see you at the fellowship hall. We got to talk to you. And I thought, well, he's just going to encourage them and pray for them. And, and we'll start all this disciple stuff later. Because that's a long process. You ain't going to accomplish that overnight. But when we got in the fellowship hall, God be my witness, the preacher, everybody got saved. And the preacher began to ask individuals, just pulling them out. What do you believe about this? What do you believe about this? Do you understand what this is? Do you understand what this doctrine is? And finally, I was sitting there thinking, I don't understand that. I'm the evangelist and I don't know half the answers to half the questions. You've already been asking these people. Listen to me. Ask me to explain salvation. You want me to explain it to you? I can't. I can't even explain salvation. It's bigger than I am. I don't understand how come God loves you and loves me the way he does. In and while we were yet sinners, he demonstrated his love for us. I don't understand that. If you think that you've got to understand everything to get saved, God help us. Do you know what it takes to get saved? Faith. You just got to believe that He loves you and that He wants to save you and that you have something to be saved from. And then you repent from that that you know in your heart is not like God. Do you know what sin is? It's everything about you that's not God. That's sin. And we commit that unto Him. We recognize our need. Dear God, I'm a sinner. We open our heart, not to religion, not to preachers, not to churches. Open our heart to Jesus. And then we pray the prayer. However you pray it, you've got to pray it. You have got to, with your heart, ask Jesus to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Amen or not. And then E, listen to me. We're almost through. Aren't you glad rope is not plural? <laughs> e, enjoy the life. Did you know if you pray and ask Jesus into your heart tonight, listen to me. I don't want you to think it's like taking a dose of medicine. For we ain't going to baptize you in embalming flood. Life's not over. When you get saved, enjoy the life. Now, some of you do look like you've been baptized in pickle juice. No wonder more people don't want what we're trying to say. I don't know if you know it or not, but we ought to be the happiest people walking the face of this earth. My sins are forgiven. Past, present, and future. My sins are... I have been declared righteous. I've been made righteous by God. Amen. As far as God is concerned, I'm already in heaven. I'm already, Scripture says, I'm already there. I'm already seated in the heavenlies. I'm on my way. Some of you are saying, I wish you'd get going. Get on up there. Enjoy the life. Enjoy the life. Are you having fun being saved? Man, some people won't give their heart to the Lord because they look at us and we make it look like you know, it's, it's something that you've got to kind of drudge through now. Can I just tell you this? Listen, you see that cross right there? That cross is not a minus sign. That cross is a plus sign. And contrary to what anybody else may not have, have tried to sell you, listen to me. Listen to this little fat preacher. Jesus wants to add everything to your life that gives life. He don't want to take anything from you. He wants to give you life. He wants you to enjoy your Christianity. Smile. Have fun. 
shout, stomp, clap, say amen. Amen? amen. <laughs> and you say, do you, ever, do you really feel like you need to tell us that kind of stuff? Yeah, I've been with you for four days. Listen, you need to get over it. Just, just get over yourself. Take God very serious and the things of God very serious. Take yourself a little less serious. Give yourself just a little bit of slack. You're not perfect. You're in the process. It's called sanctification. One of these days when you're presented to God, that's called glorification, you will be like Jesus. But some of you need to cut yourself just a little bit of slack. Enjoy this trip. He wants you to have fun. I think Jesus has a sense of humor. I know he does. I'm looking at you, hallelujah. I know he has a sense of humor. He's a good God, amen? He's a good God and he loves you. Did you hear what she said when she was singing? Jesus loves you. And he doesn't love you when you're good. He just loves you. He doesn't quit loving you when you're not so good. He just loves you. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. With every head bowed and with every eye closed, and, and listen to me, I'm going to ask Roy to play. I want him to work himself to death. I want him to do whatever he feels led to do as the Spirit leads him. But listen to me. Are you saved? Do you know that you know that you know? If I was to stand before God tonight, I'm not crossing my fingers. I'm, I'm, I'm not hoping so. I know in my heart that I have done exactly what is set forth in Scripture for a man or a woman to have a personal relationship with Jesus. I have surrendered my life to him. Do you know for sure you're saved? I'm going to lead you in a sinner's prayer. Now listen, you know, there, there's folks who criticize this. But I honestly cannot tell you the hundreds upon hundreds of people through the years have said, listen, thank you for helping me do that. Thank you for taking me by the hand and helping me. I didn't know what to say. I, did, I didn't know what to do. Listen, I'm not saving anybody. I'm not doing this to save anybody. I'm just trying to lead you into what you can do yourself. Let my prayer help you. If you need to pray and ask Jesus into your heart, all I'm doing is guiding you. I'm trying to help you do that. Pray something like this right there where you're sitting. Pray something like this. Honestly in your heart, dear Lord, no more running. No more excuses. No more putting you off. I know I need you, Lord. And I know there's something missing in my heart and my life. And I know what it is. It's you. And Lord, I'm asking you to come into my heart. Just pray it to him. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin and save my soul tonight. Lord, I surrender my life, my way, my will to you. I'm asking you from this very moment to be the Lord of my life. Now you might pray this to him. Lord, I'm nervous right now. There's a lot of unknowns. I don't know what you're even going to desire from me from this moment on, but Lord, I'm nervous. But I pray that you'd help me not be ashamed. I do not want to be ashamed of what you have done in my heart tonight. Now listen, with every head bowed and with every eye closed, listen to me, young people. If you have prayed the sinner's prayer, whether it be last night or last week or last month, I don't want you to be confused. I'm not asking you to do it again. I'm not asking you to do it over and over again. If you prayed and asked Jesus into your heart tonight for the very first time, you understood what you were doing, and you gave your heart to Jesus because you knew you needed to, and you've done it tonight, and this is your first time to ever pray and ask Jesus into your heart. I want you to do something. Mom, dad, children, 
If you gave your heart to Jesus tonight and you don't mind Pastor Tim and me knowing it, would you do something bold and brave right now? Trust us in this moment. No one's going to use you, embarrass you, none of that kind of nonsense. If you gave your heart to Jesus, would you just lift your head and would you open your eyes and would you look at me? If you gave your heart to Jesus, listen. Sis, did you give your heart to Jesus? Is that why you're looking up? Okay. Don't want anybody to be confused. I'm not asking saved people to get saved again. I'm asking lost people to give their heart to Jesus. All right, is there anybody else? Preacher, I'm nervous. I don't know what all you're going to ask me to do. Not anybody getting saved again for the very first time. Here I am, preacher. I'm giving my heart to you. Anybody else? I want everybody to look up just a minute. You've been so patient. And when we give this invitation, listen, once again, my ego is it's not on the line. If you feel led to come and make an altar out of these front pews or this stage, I want you to come. Listen, most of us have a lot that we need God to help us through, amen, to intervene and to carry us through. If you gave your heart to Jesus tonight, whether or not you looked at us or not, there were some who looked, but whether or not you looked at us or not, when we give the invitation, I just want you to boldly come forward, grab the preacher by the hand, and just say, I did it. And he's not going to make you prove it. He's going to rejoice with you and pray with you. And that long process of teaching you what you've done tonight, that'll all begin another time. That's his job another day. But right now, tonight, if you gave your heart to Jesus, we just want to rejoice with you. We want to enjoy this moment with you. Are y'all still glad you came to church? Amen. All right. Heavenly Father, I pray that when we stand in just a minute and we give this invitation, I pray that those children that looked at me will come, and I pray nobody will be confused. Lord, if I have, if I have confused the simplicity of the gospel and your love for them and their need for you, God, I, I pray that you'd, you'd clean that up. Don't let me mess it up. Father, thank you for the saving of souls. Father, I pray that it will have been a blessing tonight for everyone here to just celebrate the cross and what you did on the cross for us and instead of us. And God, we love you. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Let's stand together. You come. You come. If you get